on Honey Island in Louisiana. A creature terrorizes the curious few who dare to venture into its habitat. Every time I go out in the swamp, I'm always <laughs> going to look around because, you know, I'm always aware that at any mi minute this thing could show up. <laughs> you hear that? And my very first impression was, what in the hell is that? Beware of the Honey Island Swamp Monster. Louisiana is jazz, festivals, Cajun culture, and of course, the charming New Orleans. And the Big Easy is surrounded by exceptional landscapes. The arms of the Mississippi create a vast labyrinth of swamps before draining into the sea. These bayous, sparsely populated and often inaccessible by car, inspire awe and a sense of mystery. The Honey Island Bayou is one of the best preserved in Louisiana. It's so inhospitable that even experienced hunters often refuse to return. In these ancient bayous, it's not only the known predators that you have to worry about, there's also a monster. In 1963, Harlan Ford was in this area to hunt. But on a night when the moon was dim, a different predator was waiting for him. His granddaughter, Dana Holyfield, shares his story with us. We were walking fast with a heavy load when we saw the hind quarters of what appeared to be the, a large animal standing on all fours in the trail. But as we approached within 20 feet, Bill exclaimed in a loud voice, what the hell is that thing? The creature had evidently failed to hear our, us approaching up the trail, but at the loud sound of Bill's voice, it swung around and faced us. This thing glared at us for a ferocious manner for only a split second, then raised up and ran on its hind legs, disappearing over a mound of briars and brush. This was the letter that I found in my grandfather's belong when we, my mom sold his house after my grandmother passed away, and we found the letter I guess it was in 1974. And it sort of explains in detail his actual experiences. He had told us, me when I was a child, and every, you know, his friends and family, but over the years, things get exaggerated and, you know, people tell a story and then it, by the time it gets around the table, it's changed. So when I found this and it documented his actual, what he said, then it's like, you know, we know the truth, like what really happened. Until his death in 1980, Harlan Ford never stopped looking for the creature he saw in the bayous of Honey Island, located a stone's throw from the small and quiet city of Slidell. Aria Leavani is the historian of record in Slidell. She has just written an essay on the history of the city. Slidell is located uh, three miles from uh, north of Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, we're 30 miles from downtown uh, New Orleans. We are in the ozone belt. I mean, we, the mayor always says we're the best kept secret on the North Shore, and we really are. It, the area is, is just a mystery. You know, nobody really wants to go digging around in the swamp with alligators and the snakes and things like that. It's, it's beautiful. You know, if you like to take pictures, it's a great place to go. And then maybe you might get a picture of some strange animal. It's in Pearl River, a small town of 2,000 people, that the monster has most often been sighted. That's the home of the Honey Island Swamp, which is put of it. <laughs> and that's our West Pearl River. James Levine is the mayor of this city on the shores of the bayou. Uh, it's, yes, it's the talk of the town. Sure is. And they've seen him, they've heard about him, and, uh, you know, it's just, I guess, I, 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 I guess for sure he's for real, you know? We are in the middle of Honey Island Swamp. It borders the Mississippi, 
Mississippi and Louisiana, and this Pearl River that we're on right now is what divides us. And this is a very big swamp. It's one of the most primitive swamps in America. Our people and a lot of our people out of, all around the country, they come in here and hunt, do a lot of fishing, uh, a lot of uh, sightseeing now with the uh, boat tours and stuff, with the alligators. It's a beautiful swamp. Uh, a little bedroom community. Uh, everybody knows everybody. Uh, we clean. It's just, it's home to everybody. The island that we're on here is called Goat Island. This is where our camp is. And uh, further up is where my grandfather first encountered the Honey Island Swamp Monster. The monster described in Harlan Ford's memoirs is terrifying. Its loins were slender while the chest and shoulders were tremendous. The head and face had a square appearance and the entire body was covered with short, dingy gray hair. The he head had long, wild hair that almost touched the ground. Some of the footprints are over 10 in inches long with reptile-like claws and toes, while the heel and art are characteristics of the big ape family. In 1974, Harlan Ford discovered footprints he believed belonged to the monster of the bayou. His story spread across the region. In 1974, that's when they found this dead hog that had its throat ripped out. Flies were swarming. They kept going a little ways. They was wondering what would kill a hog up in the woods like this and just leave it there to rot. And that's when he saw tracks. Well, he went back later with Plaster Paris and made Plaster Paris tracks. Researchers from the Louisiana Wildlife and Fish Commission analyzed the imprints and could not link them to any known animal, which fueled rumors that a monster lives in Honey Island's bayous. Moreover, Dana describes her grandfather as a down-to-earth man a former air traffic controller and an experienced hunter, he knew how to keep his cool and was not one to fantasize. And he also was a musician, and he had a lot of friends in high places, as you could say. So it's like he was maybe putting his reputation on the line by coming out and saying this, because, you know, he used to fly his plane to the governor's mansion and play music for, you know, he'd get all his music friends to go over there. You know, and he, you know, he knew a lot of people, so to come out with a story like that, he, I guess he was, he chanced it and he didn't really care because he knew what he had seen. He said, I don't care if they believe me or not, I know what I saw. I just knew he was just very serious on finding out more about it, and I felt like after he passed away, I had to carry on what he was doing. I wanted to find out. <laughs> For Dana, there is no doubting the existence of the Bayou Monster. She herself has seen it, as have neighbors and members of her family. This is the case for David Shute, who lives on Pearl River. I enjoy it. That's part of living in Louisiana here, you know? It's, it's, you're surrounded by nature and it provides for you. That's yeah, a beautiful thing. Come on, girl. It was, it had gotten dark in the evening. I had a little fire going just for light. And we had been walking down the bank, messing with the frogs and, and, and we come back by my boat and we set our gear down and we're headed back up towards the tent. And got back just about to the tent, kind of by the fire. And then something ran out from behind the tent. <laughs> and when I say something ran out, it ran out. I mean, it was moving. It took off from behind the tent, and it leapt and dove into the water. I don't know a creature 
that can do that. First thing I did when it happened, I ran back to my boat. I got my Q-beam on it, and I shined over there. Its head wasn't above water. I don't know any animal in this swamp that swims with its head below water. None. And I was fairly nervous the rest of the evening. <laughs> I didn't leave my gun from my side after that, because <laughs> I didn't know if it was coming back. The last recorded sighting was by Deborah Chester in August 2013, while she was visiting her mother near Pearl River. And I'd went down the hill into an old creek bed, an old creek bed, and had come up at the top of the hill, and my phone had went off, and I kind of glanced down to see what was on the phone. When I looked up, I saw this thing crossing the road. And my very first impression was, what in the hell is that? And, and it, it was wobbling his arms swinging, its arms like this, and the hair was hanging down, long, matted, you know, like a horse's tail. It hadn't been brushed, you know, matted. It was reddish brown, not black, and it jumped the fence. So I stopped the car, like a crazy person, and uh, ran up to the gate, and I stood on the bottom rung of the gate trying to see it, and I could hear it crashing through the woods, and I was leaning to the left and right trying to see if I could see this thing, still didn't know what I had saw and the smell hit me. And I remember looking down at the ground, both sides thinking, like this, thinking, there's a dead animal here. You know, like roadkill. No, see, I've been a nurse for 25 years. I have smelled some stuff. <laughs> I've smelled some bad stuff in my life, in my career, I should say. This was not something I had smelled before. This was not nice. It scared me, because the hair went up on the back of my neck thinking, this thing was out there probably looking at me. I don't know, I would think if there's something out there, he's living off the animals around him because the swamp is plentiful. There's food everywhere. But then again, maybe if you're tired of eating the same old thing, maybe some new smell interests you. I don't know. And I've told a few people, you know, that's, that's the main thing. People need to know this thing is out there and it's real. And no one's gonna convince me otherwise because I know what I saw. I don't know what they are but I'm convinced there's something there. I've seen something out there in them woods. If you want to call it a monster, I guess we can call it a monster. I definitely believed him. Just, you could see it in his face that he knew it. He had saw something. You know, you gotta understand, <laughs> I was born and raised in these woods, right around the corner, not a not hundred feet from where I saw this thing. That's where I was, grew up my whole life. I know all the animals in the woods. This was not something I've ever seen before. This was something that I don't know what it is. It was the Cajuns, the descendants of the Acadians from Nova Scotia, who first settled in the bayous in the late 18th century. They built houses on stilts and subsisted on shrimp and crayfish. Even today, time seems to stand still in these swampy areas. It's been a relatively untouched area for most of the history of Louisiana. The Honey Island swamps cover 280 square kilometers, or 108 square miles, two and a half percent of which are protected by the U.S. government. And most of the people have not lived in the bottomland areas that uh, would constitute the swamp as we would think of it. They mostly live up on the, the ridges around the swampy area, but it's not an area that has a big population. This territory remains relatively unexplored, a fact that adds to its mystery. Monster or no monster, here, nature can kill you. Because there's woods, you know, there's the road, and then there's nothing behind it but woods. Like, as far back as you can go, there's woods and swamp. The Honey Island Swamp, we have uh, all kinds of wildlife here. We have, of course, alligators, and we have, uh, they say Black Panther are out here. You always hear strange sounds. You didn't know what it was, you know? Sometimes you don't want to know what it is at nighttime. You just want to get in your house where you feel safe, exactly. Lock the door. And where you feel safe. A 
Okay, guys, we're gonna put on some Cajun air conditioning. Hang on here, we're gonna get up ahead, be prepared. I don't want you to get tossed over, so hang on. John Royer organizes cruises through the bayous. See that sound I'm making? So like the sound of a baby alligator. Alligators, large alligators, are territorial and they're, they're uh, cannibals. You make a sound like that, they think it's a baby. They'll come out looking to eat the baby. For him, the existence of a monster in this inhospitable region is hardly surprising. All the captains out here, I mean, occasionally we hear things out here. You know, you, you get to know everything out here, and occasionally you hear something out here, and you don't know what it is, and you don't really want to find out either. You know, it, uh, it just, uh, uh, it, it's entirely possible. This swamp covers an area of over 250 square miles. Most of it's uninhabited wildlife, and uh, there's plenty of food sources in here. See, this one's bigger. It's a big old boy. This thing apparently moves through the swamp and occasionally moves on the fringes. People occasionally that live on the edge of the swamp, some people claim to make contact with this thing, see it moving through the trees or moving on the edge of the edge of the uh, water, or even wading through the water. The most striking evidence comes from Ted Williams, a trapper who disappeared in the bayou. Other people, there's been a few other uh, witnesses this man, old man Williams, he was an old trapper, had seen it too. The Holyfield brothers knew the mysterious Ted Williams. Oh, Mr. Shoney used to tell a tale about him being in the swamp fishing. Said it was just at daylight one morning, he was running his lines. Just before the day, he had to be out and go to work. Said he had a big fish on the line, he'd pull it up, it'd bump. He'd feel it hang, you know, bump, yeah, hang. Said he fooled with him there for about 15 minutes. He'd pull him up and poop and shine that light over. He could see his eye, but he couldn't ever, couldn't ever get the fish to come on up. So he fooled around. He said, "Well, I'll work him around to the other side of the boat and see if I can get him out behind that limb." Said he leaned over there and looked, and there was that fish's other eye. He was hitting the bottom of the boat for the reason he couldn't come up. <laughs> You'd had to know Mr. Shoney to appreciate it. I know Ted Williams too. Yeah. <laughs> so my grandfather. Went, had to go meet with old man Williams. And, and him and my grandmother, she told me they went out there to see him. And he said, uh, he's like, yeah, I see, I see it all the time. He said, but it ain't just one. He said, I see them swimming in pairs. And they go across the river. And he said, I don't bother them, they don't bother me. One time, he was so close, they got out and they shook off their hair and it, he was close enough it wet him. And then they just went on into the woods. But then old man Williams come up missing one day and they never found him. They found his boat, but they didn't find him. And some people say he just got too close, you know, but they never found his body. Several hypotheses have developed to explain the origin of the monster. In one, a train carrying a traveling circus derailed in 1920, releasing chimpanzees into the bayou and the monster is a cross between a chimpanzee and an alligator. And that's funny, because you go up, uh, up in country a little bit, and the Crawfords and Singletaries and all that, and they'll, their ancestors will tell you, literally, I shot something in this tree, I thought it was a squirrel, and out fell a monkey, you know? So, I mean, that did happen. But uh, what exactly is out there? I don't know. I'd like to know. I'd like to know. Another hypothesis is that the monster could be linked with NASA's Stennis Space Center, located 43 kilometers or 27 miles from Slidell. Not too far from here, if you cross through that swamp, they have the government Stennis test site. Who knows what they make over there? Maybe something got out. <laughs> they crossbred something. I mean, I hear stories that they, they're crossbreeding like man and ape. I mean, I've heard that. Maybe something like that got out. You know, you don't, I don't know, but, or maybe it's an alien, I don't know. It's just something that's not, that just can't go walking around in town. I mean, you can, it stays very well camouflaged in the swamp. It's, there's so much, so many places in the swamp it could hide. 
You know, in a way I am. I'm always, particularly when I go through areas where there's exposed mud, I'm always looking for tracks and things like that. But uh, I imagine, that I think they're probably more active, you know, at night or in the more remote areas of the swamp than they are around on the edges here. But yeah, I'd, I'd kind of like to think that occasionally I might spot something moving through the trees there. After the death of Harlan Ford in 1980, his wife Yvonne found several rolls of film in a box. One was marked Honey Swamp Monster. These are the images Dana used for a documentary she made on the monster in 2007. Though there has been much controversy about the existence of this Louisiana Honey Island Swamp Monster, I managed to locate several new eyewitnesses who had more recent sightings since Ford and Mills first saw this creature in 1963. Whenever I was doing the documentary film, my grandmother, Yvonne Ford, who was married to Harlan, came out and said, I don't know if you could use this, but he's had this, this film. I found it in his belongings after he died. There was one labeled Honey Island Swamp Monster and a little piece of masking tape. And I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, could this be what I think it might be? First, it starts off with his boat ride up the river and through the swamp, and then a tree, a tree bond that he used to sit in. And then after a while, something just starts walking across the swamp. He was up probably about 100 yards in the tree bond away from it. So he must have got, got closer than we thought he did. And my, I asked my grandmother, I said, why don't you think he ever reported this? Like, showed this to the media. And she said, probably because he was so afraid people were going to shoot it and kill it. And he just wanted to find out more about it. And he never went to that swamp without his camera, you know, when he was really trying to find out more about this thing. And so it was just amazing that he actually captured something on film. And it took years later for us to discover it. Dana now devotes her life to cataloging the observations of witnesses and exploring potential habitats. She has also written two books on the subject. In short, the monster of the bayous has become her obsession. She regularly travels the waters of the bayou looking for the creature. Sure you don't want to go with me this time? Well, one day I'm going to come back with him and you're going to be surprised, or at least with some more evidence. I'm taking my camera because I don't want to ever be out there without it in case I come across some type of evidence that, you know, that would prove that there is something out there. And I'm going to put my hat on because I don't like spiders getting in my hair. Okay, y'all ready? Dustin, I'm going to uh, take him with me because I trust him to get us in and get us out. <laughs> so it's my nephew. Woo. We're going to go in through here down this slough and uh, look for any signs along the banks to where a good place to get out, walk into, a good opening, just to see what's at, you know, if there's any kind of new evidence out here. Dana was eight years old when her grandfather found the footprints of the monster and 14 years old when he died. Her youth was rocked by the pursuit of this monster. There's a few people that maybe live year round, but a lot of times people just come out here on the weekends to stay at those. We used to have a houseboat around that corner when I grew up. Come here every weekend. Used to, I remember we used to jump off the top of the houseboat into the slough 
Nowadays, I think I wouldn't let my kids do it. My mom said, Mom, you let me jump off that roof? But yeah, we had a lot of fun out here. I'm probably a little bit scared, um, but I'm, all, I'm always trying to stay alert and, and um, hopefully if I do see this thing that he won't try to hurt me. <laughs> and, but I just would like to see it, you know, just to see what my grandfather saw. I've been I've been in this area a long time, but I mean you you could say you know something, but it changes through the seasons. And like say when Hurricane Katrina hit this area, they had so many logs and vegetation, just everything just was tore up. So many trees fell in this this slough, and then everything just grew rapidly. Like. Although she's very familiar with the location, it's important not to underestimate the savage nature of the bayou. And you might know it. You could go in there and think you know the swamp. But you, you could get so turned around in a swamp, get lost so easy. So it's good to keep a phone on you in case. It, hopefully it'll, you'll get a signal if you got lost. But there's been a lot of people, hunters mostly, that get lost out there and they have to call someone. You know, they have to get search and rescue to go find them. going really deep into the swamp right now. Got to go deep to see. To, uh, I think if you, the deeper you go, the more chances you might come across something. That looks like a good spot to go in, so just pull, pull us up there. Bayou is incredibly hot in summer, usually above 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit with high humidity. Here, plants and wildlife take precedence over human activity. In addition to well-known predators like alligators, the bayou is full of small species, raccoons, reptiles, turtles, and many varieties of spiders. In short, the swamp monster isn't lacking for food. <laughs> Dustin! I'm in a spider web. Can I get, <laughs> get if it? If it's a spider, don't tell me. Just get it off. <laughs> what? Got one. Gotta watch for snakes. Um. All Louisianans will tell you that the bayous are an intriguing place, but to believe in the existence of a monster, that's a line the Holyfield brothers are not ready to cross. It's some people do, some don't. I believe it's just like anything else that, that a legend or myth they try to keep alive, you know? People, some people, nobody actually really believes it, I think. They just want to believe it. Dana has carefully preserved the casts of footprints that her grandfather made in 1974. But today, the Holyfield brothers challenged the authenticity of that evidence. Yeah, well, Harlan and them were supposed to find some tracks over on the gas line. Ever how long it's been that gas line out there been through there, right after they put that yeah. in, they found them tracks, supposedly. But Harlan had a camp right there by it too, you know, right by the gas line on Cuffin Lake. I don't know where to believe him or not to believe him, but I, I really don't think much about the Harlan. You know. I just walked up the little dra a drain that comes in behind that camp. That, that, Harlem Ford, whatever who that was, built the camp. camp. Uh, and I was standing there and I happened to glance down in the bottom of it and all I saw was the, the foot sticking up out of the mud and leaves. Didn't see the shoe. And uh, it was covered up with mud and leaves except for the foot. It was sticking like that 
up out, out of the, in the bottom of that slough. Without a doubt, you can look at the bottom of the shoe and see the molds at the, from up here, and it's identical. The day Rick found that foot, we laid it out on the front porch. His daddy put a camouflage suit of clothes there and stuffed it full of rags. And when Harlan and Dan got out of that vehicle, Harlan was saying, yeah, that's him right there. You've got him. And it wasn't nothing that a water fish or foot, you know. Who you reckon put them tracks on that gag line? Harlan Ford put them on there. He claimed that he had the, the shoe with the track glued on it that was found near my grandfather's camp in the mud. And then he tried to say that that's when, well, those were my grandfather's shoe. You know, we first thought, well, I went to look at this. I wanted to see this shoe with the track and compare them with the one I had. And for one thing, the shoe was little. My grandfather's foot would have never fit in that foot because he stood six foot four. Ricky Holyfield was about, and, and the shoe was small. To me, they didn't, I mean, it looked like long fingers with no webbing on them glued to this, this shoe. But this doesn't worry Dana. She still hopes to capture the swamp monster. See, like, this mud's soft. And if there was, it's a, you know, this would be a good place if it came through here to be able to see a track because it's still soft because this used to have water over it not too long ago and the water dropped, so all this is soft mud. Wait up, Dustin. Someone even said, maybe it's one of those highland cattle that has the long, you know, the highland cattle has the long hair on it. I said, you don't think I'm stupid? I was born and raised on a farm. I grew up on a farm. I know cows, I know highland cattle. This thing walked on two legs. It walked like a human, but it wasn't human. And those who believe in the existence of the monster always pay special attention to the tracks on the ground. Who knows? You see the toes in the front? He was chasing something, a deer or something up in there. Something came in here really fast. See the tracks going up in there? Wide stride, too. See, whatever it was on the front there, those nails dug in right on the front of that print there, right in the mud as he stepped in there. That thing, that foot, that's about a foot long right in there. And those, those, those claws dug right up on the front there. People find prints in the mud, like that one that we saw over there. I don't know if that was or not. It could have just been an anomaly, but it might be. You don't know. But uh, uh, hunters out here that have been hunting out here, hunting for various things, wild hog, turkey, and things like that, there's some stories that they've had of coming in contact with one of these things out in the middle of the, uh, out in the, middle of the swamp, out in the middle of nowhere out here. The Holyfield brothers have in their possession what they believe to be proof beyond doubt that the swamp monster is a hoax. There you go, that's the shoe. That's the foot. It's still got swamp mud on the sole. Mm, still got it in it. Nothing fits it perfect because you see that hook, how that toes hook right there. See how that bead out in there? That right in there? That's all in there. And all that thick stuff there is all what it's made out of, I don't know. They cut it out with plywood and, and then they mold put that to the board and then put whatever that is on it. That's just like I found just that's it was just like this when I found it. All of this was in the mud, covered up with leaves and mud. Nothing but that foot was showing. Harlan knew who made that thing. Harlan 
Probably got his handprints all on it somewhere if you can find them. DNA in the inside. Here you'd probably find the girl's yeah. DNA up in that shoe. But Dana remains unwavering. For her, the incredulity of the Holyfield brothers only reflects an old feud between neighbors. I was told that Ricky Holyfield and my grandfather had disputes over the years because they didn't want him hunting in their territory. They were very territorial about their hunting ground. And so we thought, well, maybe he's saying it was a hoax to keep all the monster hunters away from there. And any news media or anybody that would have tried to go in there into their hunting territory and disturb their animals that they like to hunt. And if that famous shoe had served in the filming of a movie? Then, after I found the letter that Pat wrote, I thought, well, maybe, because he mentioned that Eagle Films wanted to come and do a documentary film or some type of movie about the swamp monster. After we found the, after found, found we found that foot, uh, the movie business shut down up here. Yeah, then the, then no the longer here. Down there, huh? He moved down by Davis and Lennon down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure did. And after that, we, Harlan probably never made that. He probably had some somebody make that. You know, some some of the movie people may have made that. What happened? But it was, he was going to make some money out of it, and that's what, that's that's what, it, what it was uh, about. After, I find, after we found it, that was it. No, yeah, more that, no, no more money. No more money. I was wanting to stop here. You didn't hear nothing about it anymore. Yeah. So maybe they asked, and he did say he gave them a track. That's what it was said in the letter. He gave them a track. Maybe they left the shoe glued on the track. And may, that would explain if Ricky Holyfield found it, you know, because Pat may have taken them back there and, you know, let's go, sh let me show you the area and stuff. And, and they might have done some reenactments or something like that. The story of the shoe found in the bayou made it into one of the newspapers of the time and seriously damaged Dana's grandfather's credibility. Believe it or not, Ricky Holdfield went hunting rabbit recently and he said he came up on more than he bargained for, the foot of the Honey Island Swamp Monster. For about two years, the story of a Yeti or, or Bigfoot type monster in the Honey Island Swamp has circulated among hunters and fishermen in the area. Persons have reported seeing it, liars, Mm -hmm. Hearing it and tracking it, but until Holyfield went hunting and said he found the foot, there was no tangible evidence except for a plaster cast made of the creature's track. That's all they had. And it goes on to tell about picking it up and all that bull. And who was with it? Yeah. Mosquitoes are coming out now. How'd you get through there, Dustin? <laughs> Keep on investigating until we find something. But it's starting to get dark, so... I, I don't want to get lost out here in the dark. <laughs> I mean, we're not that equipped right now because we don't have a gun on us, so I don't want to be out here too late. Um, Make a lot of difference to me what folks believe. And uh, yeah, it don't matter. As long as I know what happened, you know. Dana will continue her research in order to capture the swamp monster. Well. We went out into the middle of the swamp and we um, looked for evidence. We didn't really find any footprints or anything that you could collect and bring home with you, but um, we did hear something. And I got in a spider web, so that did it. <laughs> um, we, heard, we heard something, but we got a little closer. Maybe next time we're gonna come across something better and um, see what happens. Just keep looking for it. 
Despite the lack of hard evidence, some Louisianans firmly believe in the existence of the swamp monster. But what motivates their belief? Mystique, mystery. It's just human nature. That's all it is, it's human nature. Like anything else, it's, it's when you're a little kid, you don't want to open up the closet because it's dark. But you're dying to know what's in there. <laughs> you just want to know what's in there, you know? Or you don't want to look under your bed because you know there might be something lurking under there. And that's how the swamp is. When you're riding through there or you're looking, if you look, when you're looking at that area and you, you, you want to see something, you, you want to see something. You want to know something is in there. And we know there's nothing in there. It's just, a, just an idea. You know, I mean, and, and, and that, that's what that is. It's, it's, it's working on your psyche, supposedly, you know. I mean, in other words, like the kids say, psych. Well, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's psyching you up and, te and, and letting you think that there's something in there and there really is nothing there. <laughs> what can I say? Okay, there have been reports, as is common in many areas of North America, of a uh, swamp monster. Um, we regard these reports with a healthy skepticism, uh, but many people actually still believe that there is such a thing in the Honey Island Swamp. I don't believe that there is a monster in the sense that people generally talk about it. And uh, there are an awful lot of animals in the swamp that could be confused with a monster that looks roughly human. We've had uh, many reports of bears. And if you, if you get if you get only a quick look at a bear, especially if, it's, if it happens to be standing and looking around for danger, then uh, your eye can be very easily deceived. So uh, in many cases, people will see something like a bear and uh, their brains will tell them that's humanoid. It looks like something that is kind of human, but hairy and and not quite right. David Shute of Pearl River is among those who will not budge. What he saw was no common animal. I've seen just about every animal the, the swamp has to offer. I did have a, 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 a incident with a panther, and uh, I know how he moves. <laughs> this wasn't that. <laughs> he comes straight down like a little slough, a little narrow gully where the water washes away the mud. And that cat come right down the center of that trucking. You know, it let out a scream before it come through there. And when it come through there, it was moving. And he stays low to the ground. Now he can leap like what happened to me, but there's no way that he has the height. I mean, and there's no way he's gonna swim with his head below water, you know? There's just, there's nothing that can do it. Nothing that can do it. No, no other explanation, you know? Something happened though, something happened. I mean, I'm always gonna be look, on the lookout because like I said, there's been too many eyewitnesses that have seen this thing or these things that I, you know, I do think there's more than one. No, it was not a costume. Have you been to Louisiana in August? You couldn't wear a costume like that. You would die in heat stroke. You know, it's 100 degrees with 100% humidity. You couldn't wear it five minutes. I know what I saw. I just don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. But I need to. Yeah, I need to. Because I do probably once a month I'm there checking again. Because I don't live close there right now. But every time I'm in this area, I'm, I'm back looking. I'd like to know what's out there, I really would. But on the other hand, if it is still out there and, and, and it is existing, I'd hate for anybody to bring it any harm. Because it's, it's like anything else, just trying to survive. I would like to see it with my own two eyes. You know, that is something that I, I, I feel like I need to do one day. And I guess that's why I keep 
looking for it, but I don't know what I'll do if I see it. I might faint. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll just wave and say, hi, you know, don't kill me. <laughs> but no, I just, I don't know. I just feel like I know something's back there and I'm always gonna look over my shoulder.